And a big thanks to our sponsor, Niagara Conservation. They have some of the lowest flowing and affordable, but conventional toilets in the world. And a, a big introduction to the Stealth Toilet, a 0.8 gallon per flush, single flush uh, uh, toilet, and then a new dual flush that goes down to 0.5. You definitely cannot get any lower than this without risking a backup. Using vacuum assisted technologies and other innovations, we have glowing reviews from affordable housing renovation developers who only spec this toilet because it is more durable than conventional toilets and helps reduce the growing water bills that directly impact low income residents. You know it works in these situations, you'll know it will work anywhere. Uh, the original Stealth now with a durable side handle Innovative and stylish, it adds timeless elements to what is otherwise a very forward-thinking toilet. These toilets are, can also be fully ADA compliant and ensure the trending integration of accessibility into green building. Bonus, Niagara and AM Conservation have water sense certified 1.25 gallon per minute shower heads, 0.5 gallon per minute faucet aerators, and 0.5 gallon per minute sink aerators for new and existing buildings. These low flow devices feel like anything normal, uh, but save much more water and reduce energy through hot water needs. All right, well, welcome everybody to a building framework for an all renewable energy future. Uh, today's uh, speaker is going to be um, uh, Brown and Barry. Uh, she was educated in South Africa, the UK and USA and holds a bachelor's of arts degree. She completed uh, her postgraduate studies in architecture at UC Berkeley and currently works as the design director at One Sky Homes, a Silicon Valley passive house and net zero energy design build firm. She's a certified passive house designer and founding member of both Passive House California and the North American Passive House Network. She has served as a chair of Passipedia Committee for the International Passive House Association and currently serves as president of North American Passive House Network and co-president of Passive House California. Uh, Ms. Barry is widely recognized for her Passive House advocacy work and her dynamic presentation focus on Passive House related topics. She's regularly invited to present at local, national, and international Passive Houses, House and Green Building related gatherings. Uh, highlights include keynote addresses at the 2015 ISIAQ conference in Boulder, Colorado, the U.S. Forestry Department's 2015 North American Wood Window and Door Symposium, and the 2015 and 16 South Pacific Passive House conferences. So with that, I am very excited to have Ms. Barry here with us today, and let's get going. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, the introduction and uh, the opportunity uh, to participate in these uh, in in this webinar. So um, I'm looking forward to really trying to get my head around this um, primary energy renewables framework. Um, it's a re re relatively new uh, structure that has been uh, developed by the Passive House Institute, and um, is really transforming the way. Uh, we will be building and, and designing uh, uh, buildings for this all renewable energy future. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a quick overview here. Looks like my slide forwarding is uh, flipping through your slide deck. Here, I've got to my deck here. There it is. So, um, just to give everybody an overview of what I'll be covering today. Um, first of all, I will look at what is source um, or primary energy. Um, and I use those two words in interchangeably. They're, they're referencing the same thing. Just so that we all have a common baseline understanding of what I'm actually referencing um, as I move through this, this framework. Then we'll look at uh, primary energy factors and how they apply uh, specifically to electricity, uh, sort of a utilization factor. I uh, will look at how those are actually pretty local, um, regional, and can be uh, designed to be climate specific. We will also then um, take a look at the, the all renewable energy uh, framework that uh, the Passive House Institute has developed um, to be able to incentivize our transition uh, to, a, to a, a built environment that actually does 
utilize um, all renewable uh, energy as uh, as its grid source energy as well as sort of site locally produced. And we look at the the fundamental sort of design framework that um, that they developed to uh, create this primary energy renewable uh, framework. And then we'll look specifically at how this actually applies uh, to specific regions, and I'm, I'm going to focus on California today, just because that's where I'm located. Um, and it just will give you a sort of better sense of like how, how it actually gets implemented. And, um, and then finally, we'll look at a few building examples. These will be across, across North America, so they're not specifically Californian, for those of you that are joining us from elsewhere. Um, just so you get a better sense of how how this would modify buildings and, and, and how it gets implemented in the field. So let's start with um yeah, I'm having I'm having a little technical difficulty here with uh, moving the slide along. There we go. So primary energy. What what um you know how do we differentiate between energy that gets generated or used at the site versus energy that um, is generated at the source? Um, which, which, also, which I'm also referring to as prime energy. And our typical accounting for, for energy use uh, at, at buildings is, is often um, site energy. So if you look at this, this illustration, the top um, building is assuming it's got a big solar um, array on the, on the roof uh, in summer. It's generating a lot of energy, and the demand in the building, the red, um, the fill inside the building is sort of the, the amount that of energy this building would use in the summer. So it's reasonably low in the summer. Demand is not as high, uh, but generation is high, and so all the excess energy is is, is theoretically sent back into the grid, um, and in the sort of fantastical world that that energy gets stored somewhere um, and then in the winter when our demand is much higher but our generation is lower we can uh, extract that back from the grid and utilize that in our building but the reality of it is uh, to generate energy uh, there are lots of uh, line losses and then there's generation losses that happen at the uh, production facility at the power plant um, and typically, uh, at the moment, it's, it's uncommon for your excess uh, energy that gets generated in the summer to be stored, and then that energy that you've generated theoretically on your with your with your renewable um, PV to get supplied back to your building. So the reality um, that I'm illustrating from this is it's really a bit of fuzzy math. Um, Um, site energy is, is, you know, is not a zero sum game. Um, there are losses, and there's additional accounting that has to be included. So if we go um, to how, you know, how that, what that utilization factor is, and the the, um, the generation of power at the at the source at the power plant. Um, you can see from this little illustration that I that I sourced from the Autodesk. Um, an Autodesk workshop. There's there's both transport losses. There's you know in the extraction of, of um, this the power source. So for the, in this illustration, it's obviously coal. Uh, there's conversion losses at the power plant, uh, and then there's tr uh, transmission losses. So um, for each watt that actually re uh, reaches your house, um, on average, there's about three. Um, three to three point three uh, watts of electricity that are used um, in generating that one watt that that reaches your building. So this is what I'm talking about when I refer to this utilization factor for electricity. Yeah, sorry, I'm having a hard time, Brett. With the uh, here we go, forwarding the slides. So forgive the delays. Um, so this chart really shows um, for for grid purchase electricity, the, the site source ratio is, is, a, is an average here in the US 
about 3.3. Um, On-site renewables have a have a really much more efficient um, utilization factor at one. Um, natural gas is also at about one, so not too much um, you know, inefficiencies in terms of, of its utilization factor. And then all the other you know, uh, power sources are also around one. So if you look at that number, um, currently you know, the incentive is structured to where um, there's a big inefficiency in, in, in theoretically in, in, uh, in the utilization factor for electricity sourced from the grid. And this is actually, uh, if you break this down, it actually also changes by region um, somewhat. So the national factor on um, top right, you can see about 3.3. But um, because our grid is not all one uniform um, entity, um, there are other regions um, that actually have a little bit of a higher than national average um, utilization factor for, for their, their grid supply, the electrical grid supply. Uh, Alaska is pretty high. Uh, Hawaii is a, a little bit lower than average. And then the Texas is also um, higher than average. And, okay, moving right along. Um, so I've got to hit the forward button here a little bit harder. <laughs> There we go. Um, the eastern region is all, is about the 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 same as as national average, but the western region, if you look at the that um, square down the bottom left there, um, we actually have a little bit of a better um, grid um, source energy factor at 2.8. So um, and that's probably uh, has a lot to do with. Um, how dirty or how clean the grid is, and you know, dirty and clean is all, all relative. Um, I use that that term sort of pretty loosely. But if you look at the, the actual generation, um, the source energy generation that's used in these these various regions, um, gross gen, you know, in, in gross generalization terms, the western grid you can see has a lot more uh, hydropower, a lot of solar and a lot of natural gas, um, whereas the eastern uh, side of the country, um, also lots of gas everywhere, um, a lot more nuclear up in the northeast there, uh, our, our coal, coal belt, the rust belt in the mid, midwest makes for a, a pretty um, high utilization factor for um, electricity in that region. Um, but we also have a lot of good wind. Um, generation in the in the central prairies plains region, um, and also a growing solar um, solar um, grid input uh, on that east coast. So um, that really affects uh, that utilization factor. Uh, hydro and solar are obviously a little bit uh, a better um, source energy supply. So. Oh. If we go back to this um, this illustration showing you know conversion of of material source material into electricity to supply our, our grid, what we really are looking to do um, as we transition off uh, fossil fuels and into an all renewable energy future, what we really need to do is um, remove that non renewable energy from our electrical grid supply. Um, and add all renewables to that uh, to that supply chain, and that's slowly transitioning. Um, it's a, obviously a, a bit bigger of a, a topic than I'll be covering here today, um, but that's that's the way that the uh, utilities are, are transitioning. It's uh, coal is on its way out, despite the recent political. Um, machinations, um, the economics of renewables are are going to be shifting us in that direction. Um, and you can see back from this chart again, on-site renewable has a really great utilization factor. But um, currently, 
there are still a big incentive um, for non-renewables to, to be utilized on uh, in building design and in specifying of equipment because the current the way the the utilization factor is and, and the, the actual reality of them is they they do have a very efficient um, conversion from from site to, to end use so um, in redesigning this framework for buildings um, and in order to transition to an all renewable energy future what really needs you know it was it was pretty clear that we need to sort of restructure these this um, utilization factor so that renewable energy actually gets incentivized um, and that we start to design our buildings to um, have more favorable you know, be more favorable to utilize uh, renewable energy sources so visualizing that all um, renewable energy future uh, the past health institute did some really uh, interesting work in terms of looking at uh, how buildings would need to be designed in order to actually optimize um, an all renewable energy future. And this uh, graphic uh, on the bottom here is, is a sort of a building um, consumption um, annualized, so monthly um, demand versus the solar um generation capacity and this obviously changes um in every climate in every region across the the world and it also depends on how your building is designed uh, so this is a low energy building so a, a better than average uh, building and this one is actually la located in athens um, i picked athens as a something similar to a, a climate you found in southern california hot Mediterranean, um, but still you can see even in a hot Mediterranean climate, um, high demands in the winter that exceed the generation um, capacity for renewables at, to be able to supply. So the disconnect between demand and supply is, is really what we're looking at, but the benefit, and, and I'll also just cover that briefly, um, in the summer where there is much more supply than there is demand, um, there's the opportunity for that um, renewable energy to actually uh, be uh, converted into some sort of seasonal long-term storage um, supply uh, capacity. But as I said, the issue here is even, even a low energy building, so a, a, a better than average building, will has a big uh, disparity between uh, time of, of, of generation and, and time of use. Um, and this is a passive house building in the same climate. Um, and I'm really trying to illustrate the difference. Um, obviously, much lower demand uh, and a much more even demand across winter and summer. But still, even in a passive house, you can see a disparity between the amount that is required uh, of energy required in the, the heating season compared to the cooling season and the disparity between the, the renewable uh, generation uh, supply times. So um, if we look to, um, sorry, I've got to hit the button three times to move the slide along. <laughs> um, so if we look to what would that framework look like if we did uh, vision, envision a, um, an environment where all of our uh, energy is generated by renewables? And uh, you can see from the Sankey uh, diagram, um, all of this uh, supply is coming from hydro, wind, and solar, uh, various um, generation locations. It's getting fed into the grid, uh, and the primary uh, amount of it is 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 getting directly used uh, by the buildings. Um, but you can see uh, there is still some uh, discrepancy where uh, in seasonal uh, um, demand, you can see some is still needed to be generated 
um, we can we can do short term uh, storage capacity, which is already uh, becoming quite popular. Uh, we have uh, lots of new products coming online um, already happening across the world. Uh, lots of manufacturers um, creating these um, smaller um, short term st uh, storage batteries. We have uh, Tesla's got, got the whole um, uh, an installation in Hawaii, and uh, Zonin's got, got uh, home plug-in ones. Um, so that is already becoming a reality, and and that's you know that's great. We we'll need those, but that's um, you know for that will cover demand during off-peak hours, um, overnight, and for those three to four days where you might not have um, sunshine. Um, but they are not the total uh, package solution. We will still require some seasonal storage that is um, that can actually uh, power buildings when for those longer periods in winter where there is no um, renewable generation and we need to have some backup um, oops, going the wrong way uh, back capacity. Um, those are also already um, starting to come online. Uh, these are two uh, items I've, I've clipped from Twitter. Um, articles talking about um, renewable, converting renewable power to uh, methane gas and uh, having that be uh, available for this long term uh, seasonal storage for those long colder winter periods where, uh, as I said previously, there is not enough um, renewable generation. And on the left there, a, uh, an old coal mine in Germany is being used to store uh, this methane gas that has been generated from wind and solar and converted uh, through uh, uh, electrochemical process uh, into gas. Uh, there's also other ones uh, that have been, um, you'll, you'll probably start to see now that I've mentioned them, uh, talking about conversion into uh, hydrogen is another one. Um, so this is already happening, um, but in order for this to become a real uh, viable possibility, um, how buildings get designed uh, needs to change and new design incentives are really needed. And this is what the Passive House Institute really uh, dug deeply into uh, to see how do we um, incentivize uh, architects and mechanical engineers and builders to uh, design for this all renewable energy future. So, um, in 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 passive house world um, certification pr uh, process, um, there are the uh, three primary uh, targets that are, are required to meet passive house certification. There's a heating and cooling demand uh, target, and you can see this is at 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, or um, 4.75 in uh, IP units. Uh, there is a shift in the, the, the cooling. There is a, a sliding scale in cooling uh, climates that have um, additional additional dehumidification requirements. Uh, so that number uh, uh, varies depending on your specific climate uh, cooling climate needs. Um, there's a peak heat load uh, target number, and then there's an air tightness number. Um, and you could see from the previous slides um, show comparing the low energy building with the passive house building. Um, these have these are very important um, targets because heating particularly is absolutely our most keeping that uh, that target, that uh, level as low as possible um, is really critical in order for us to uh, rea uh, realistically achieve an all renewable energy future um, in buildings in the, in the built environment. Because uh, the winter season is our, is our most challenging uh, time to meet uh, demand um, with renewable energies and you could you could see from our previous slide, even that will require um, some sort of seasonal storage um, development um, to convert 
renewable generation into a, a long-term storable um, solution. But really, um, this primary energy renewable framework uh, focuses specifically on the bigger bucket of all the other energy that buildings use, um, which is the total primary energy number. And that was completely overhauled um, because you know, when it was looked at, there were lots of specific factors that vary um, based on uh, regional grid supply, um, solar availability, wind availability, um, and so on. And also sort of capacity for storage in specific regions. Um, so that was the area that was really um, looked at in, in, in incredible detail. Um, and I'll be covering and going into that uh, next. Um, so three new certification develop, uh, levels were developed um, that really incentivize and, and um, facilitate uh, building design for this all renewable energy future. The basic one uh, uh, remained pretty much the same as the classic level. Um, it uh, presupposes no uh, renewable energy um, uh, um, uh, supply at the building. Um, but still a really great building envelope. Uh, there are opportunities to still, um, of course, add renewable energies and to increase the performance of the building envelope. Um, and this primary energy renewable, PER, um, is, is structured as a, as a ratio of the energy supply from renewables um, as a ratio of the final energy demand at the building. So it's, it's a sliding scale, and you can see on the, on the, on the graphic here on the right. Um, so it's, it's a, a relationship between generation and demand. Um, so you can reduce the demand or increase, uh, increase the generation. And as you, as you uh, shift each of those, so you can, um, you can, uh, you're incentivized to go into these three different categories. Uh, the, the middle category, the plus energy, um, encourages uh, some uh, renewable energy uh, at the building. And the third category, the premium, um, poses a lot of generation at the building, um, but also a, a better building envelope. You can see from this section cut, um, this building is sort of a little more beefier and, and more super insulated than these, these, other, these other two. So that's essentially the framework, um, the target uh, certification framework. And I'm going to just cover a little bit more now how uh, they develop these uh, primary energy renewable factors. And we'll look at um, how these relate to specific buildings uh, across the U.S., various places in the U.S. at least. So um, in developing this framework, and I had this very animated previously, and I had to get rid of my animations, but um, this is a full enchilada. And all the, um, the calculations that go into uh, developing these primary energy renewable factors uh, for each region uh, and each climate. And uh, so we'll start with you know, total demand reduction is still very much the, the core fundamental in passive house. And those, that total energy demand reduction is then divided into um, electricity, so plug loads and lighting, um, which remain pretty constant throughout um, each, you know, both seasons, and hot water. Um, so those electri uh, electricity consumption and hot water, those are not seasonally related. They're pretty, you know, just much a function of of occupant use and, and continuous. Um, then heating and cooling were broken out into, into separate categories, and so was a dehumidification, um, because those are very uh, seasonally, uh, those are very seasonal specific, and also can um, be influenced uh, uh, by regional, uh, uh, regional factors. Uh, the third category, we looked at this already, um, your, your regional grid supply and your capacity uh, that your 
the regional grid has to add renewables is looked at. So for instance, that um, Western region has really great hydro capacity and lots of solar, um, but the Northeast um, does not have so much hydro. Um, and that is all factored into this. Um, so the, the grid supply is, is looked at in terms of uh, wind capacity, solar, uh, PV capacity, hydro capacity, um, and biomass and uh, district heating are also included, um, but there are some uh, restrictions on both of those. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there's a cap on biomass, and we can go into that a little bit further in the questions if people, if people want to know a little bit more there. Um, so number four, building site and size. Every building um, has a variable uh, capacity to generate uh, renewables, and it's often a function of roof size. Um, so um, we'll look at that a little bit further, uh, a little bit deeper later in the presentation as well. Um, but there was a, a factor developed uh, that allowed larger buildings with more smaller uh, roof um, to floor area ratio uh, to be equitably um, credited for renewable energy. Um, the supply versus demand balance was also looked at. So obviously a building in uh, Manitoba or some of the northern sort of Arctic regions of Canada uh, does not have a good, as good a, um, a renewable energy supply balance to the demand, um, and that is 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 taken into account. Uh, there's also a viable storage, short-term versus long-term storage is also looked at. So, how viable is uh, short-term battery backup? Um, you know, what is the capacity for that to actually be uh, utilized in in each climate region and each location, uh, that was that's uh, fun, uh, factored into the uh, the calculation. Number five over here, uh, regional peak load. Um, that is also a demand, a daily peak a demand is is looked at, um, and so is seasonal peak demand. And um, I'll go into that a little bit uh, deeper as well. Uh, in the, in the next couple of slides. Uh, but essentially looking at how can we design buildings to shift um, peak use um, outside of, the, of the, the biggest load to where renewables could actually viably supply um, a region's uh, electric, uh, electricity demand. Um, and that um, brings us down to number six, uh, renewable storage. Um, so kilowatt hours of short-term and long-term storage, uh, long-term energy storage needed. Um, so this is my little illustration of a, a methane tank um, that is uh, supposedly uh, renewably sourced methane. Um, and then also a little battery pack um, on the building here uh, for the short-term uh, energy usage. And then lastly, um, appliance source energy. Um, each uh, appli various appliances are given uh, specific uh, incentives in in the new framework uh, to encourage uh, fuel switching um, use, using electrical appliances uh, and predominantly heat pump appliances. So heat pumps are very much a part of the all renewable energy future. Heat pump, you know, we're getting heat pump water heaters now are very uh, are becoming quite popular. Uh, heat pump uh, clothes dryers, um, but really, essentially, moving away from um, fossil fuel and non-renewable fuel um, use appliances is is baked into this uh, new framework. So, uh, excuse me. Let me get on to the next slide there. Um, yeah, eventually I'll get there. So how does this look in California? Um, it's much easier to, you know, 
go from the theoretical to the actual um, how, how this actually translates to real buildings in a in a region that most of us at least have some familiarity with. Um, and these are the primary energy renewable factors for California's major cities. Um, and let's um, take a look specifically at the highlighted regions. In the gray, I've got San Francisco, where, where I'm based. Uh, in the middle, we've got Sacramento. So that's uh, in our little map here. Uh, San Francisco is my fog, my fog bank um, here on the coast. It's kind of middle of central California. Uh, Sacramento is is kind of a little bit inland, Central Valley, uh, climate-wise, uh, much hotter in summer and uh, uh, quite a bit colder in winter. And then we've got San Diego, the third band here in gold, uh, our sunshine uh, city all the way in the south, um, much more, a uh, much milder climate and uh, sunnier, uh, pretty, pretty much year-round. A uh, little bit of heating needed, but still not a lot. And let's look at how these pre, uh, primary energy renewable factors um, play across those three cities. Um, so for heating, any electricity and, uh, and equipment used for, for heating um, that utilizes the grid source electricity um, has been given in San Francisco a factor of 1.7, um, where we, you know, pretty relatively temperate winters, um, but still uh, you know, wanting to keep heating low, it incentivizes uh, um, designing a still a really efficient building envelope. Sacramento is at actually higher at 1.8. Um, so, and in San Diego, 1.3, where you know heating that this presupposes heating is not as big of an issue in San Diego. Uh, still, um, if you recall from the Earlier slides, um, before uh, primary energy renewable, the utilization factor for electricity was at 3.3. So this is this is a much uh, more, uh, you know, this is a much less punitive uh, utilization factor that's included in PER uh, because we do really want to incentivize buildings uh, to utilize uh, electricity. Uh, because we are assuming that it will be uh, with all renewable energy generated. Then if we look at cooling and dehumidification, um, San Francisco is one, so it's just a one-to-one -one factor, and so is Sacramento. Um, but San Diego is a slightly higher factor, 1.25. Uh, cooling is a little bit, um, the demand for cooling is a little higher in San Diego. Um, but people, you know, the, the factors, the, this is an incentive framework wants to make sure that people don't go too crazy with cooling. Um, but still, it's not such a punitive factor because um, cooling uh, demand actually coincides really well with uh, renewable energy generation uh, capacity. And uh, short-term battery storage can, can easily accommodate the, the slight uh, demand time shift. Next slide. Um, and then lastly, in California, we're looking at uh, domestic hot water generation. Um, this is, a, as I said previously, a very even uh, demand load uh, throughout the season. So you typically use about the same hot water summer and winter. Um, and you can see San Francisco and Sacramento, the factor is 1.25. And San Diego, it's a little bit lower. Uh, which I guess presupposes that you wouldn't need quite as much hot water in San Diego because you'd want cold showers maybe a little bit more than, than hot showers in, in the summer. So that's just a sort of a very a cursory overview of, of how this looks in California. Um, let's look at some other regions, um, how these primary energy renewable factors um, are implemented in, in a few other places across North America. Um, the first column on the left here is the PER default. This is sort of the default in, built into um, the Passive House Planning Package, which is the, the Passive House Energy Modeling Software. Um, and you can see again from this 
the, the default for heating electricity is now 1.81, um, which is vastly different from that 3.3 um, that is, you know, was the sort of old version um, a utilization factor for electricity. So it's, it's, it really is incentivizing electrical um, uh, systems in buildings, uh, designing our buildings to really uh, be able to utilize um, renewable energy that gets uh, supplied to the grid. Um, compared to the heating um, using oil, coal, and methanol, uh, all uh, non-renewable sources are penalized here. Uh, the utilization factor is a 2.3 um, in, the, in the primary energy renewable system. So disincentivizing buildings um, to utilize the, those source energy factors. And just um, covering, you know, Canada, the Vancouver, Whistler, Nelson, and Smithers, um, all reasonably close. Um, uh, Edmonton uh, has a much higher um, heating electricity factor, um, obviously, to uh, make sure that those buildings are really designed efficiently, um, keeping it still keeping it low. Uh, Vancouver. Um, has a very favorable um, heating electricity uh, f factor, and this is very likely due to the fact that it has uh, the the grid in in Vancouver has great uh, hydro uh, capacity, and uh, the electric supply there is very clean, and it's also uh, deliverable uh, in in the winter season. Hydro is not so um, so seasonally affected. Um, in terms of its generation. And then here in the US, this is Portland, Oregon. Um, it's much closer to the sort of the default number uh, for electrical heat, um, whereas San Francisco is a little bit lower, uh, but not nearly as low as Vancouver. And essentially, what we're seeing from this, this overview, um, heating, uh, supply generation from non-renewables is, is, is rather heavily penalized uh, with a PER factor of 2.3, uh, whereas electric, electrical supply is, is, is much more incentivized. Um, biomass is actually even more incentivized, but you can see from this little asterisk, there's a budget, there's a cap on, on the amount that you can, you can use for biomass, um, and that's really a function of um, Biomass has some other um, implications for its use um, in terms of it, it takes up um, land uh, that could be utilized for food uh, production, uh, theoretically. Uh, it also has some particular um, emissions that need to be accounted for, and so uh, it was capped to not um, make it too, um, too overutilized. So um, let's look at how this actually gets translated to some real buildings. Let's take a look at some projects here. This is a project in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, uh, um, multi-generational home, uh, multi-story in Vancouver. Uh, and you can see with the, um, the choices that the building designer has um, at, at their disposal, um, can shift this building from classic uh, to plus, um, and this particular building um, in this iteration um, didn't find a capacity to get to the premium uh, level. Um, but let's look at, you know, if it's uh, the, the basic passive house building uh, using direct electricity um, meets the classic uh, certification level. Um, it, it's slightly better with adding um, heat pumps with and without shower, um, shower heat recovery. So that's a, a drain waste uh, recovery um, a collector. But as you add um, renewables on site, so a 42 uh, meter squared PV array gets you into the plus category, and then a bigger array um, with uh, drain waste heat recovery uh, can get you a little closer to premium. But you know, you could see um, 
maybe not as much of an incentive to add add that because uh, it doesn't bump you up into the premium category. Um, and just a little aside, um, this is uh, presupposing this building is one unit. Um, there is um, if if this building was two or three units, um, you do get additional credit for for density um, and um, a higher occupation rate, um, and that would shift you into the plus category if this was a two or three unit building. Um, next project is in Maine. Um, in Maine, uh, this is a new building, uh, EcoCore uh, team being certified by certifiers. And um, you can see how shifting uh, the choices in the design uh, for this building, uh, um, which particular uh, choices would allow it to get from the classic to the plus to the premium. And uh, this is a pretty easy um, uh, shift from just regular heat pump use, uh, gets you to the classic level. Um, a small a PV array could get get this building to the plus level, and a larger PV array can get this building into the premium level. So no super magic there. Um, pretty pretty straightforward. And then finally, um, this is a building in San Francisco, a renovation uh, to a, a house in in Noe Valley, not too far from where I live. And um, Andre Harmon kindly looked at um, how this building would change uh, to the plus and the premium category by, by specifying different appliances. Um, and the, the first one is really uh, just reg it's, it's designed with a gas um, gas water heater, um, and it because of its envelope measures, it still meets the passive house classic. A certification level. If we add solar thermal, it is improved slightly, but doesn't quite get to the plus category. Um, if the uh, uh, 23 meter squared PV array is added, it does get into the plus category, so that that shifts it. Um, and then if a huge array, which uh, 114 meter squared, which is actually uh, not realistic for this particular building. I don't think it has enough roof area to really um, be able to install such array. Uh, but um, actually, that brings me to the point. Off-site renewable generation can be credited in Passive House. So in theory, this is possible, um, but it would just have to be a part of a, uh, an array uh, that is off-site and um, this house, the homeowners would have to purchase a um, uh, a share of a, a solar farm or a wind farm elsewhere. So um, I'm getting to the end here. I'm, I'm going to be summarizing what this PER framework um, really does for buildings. Um, and I created this illustration to just really give you a big overview. It's um, incentivizing renewable uh, generation supply and disincentivizing non-renewable. Um, and I want to just be clear here. It is possible to still design a building uh, in Passive House that does utilize non-renewable energy. Um, you can see from the, the previous slides, it just gets rather penalized. Um, so it's really... Um, as I say, creating this framework um, that is um, helping uh, incentivize buildings to be designed so that an all renewable energy future actually is possible. Um, at the heart of it is still um, the demand reduction uh, that Passive House has always um, been known for. Um, it, uh, this is, is not necessarily a, a viable future for all renewable if we don't reduce demand uh, at the building and specifically uh, heating demand uh, in the winter in the winter seasons when uh, our, our renewable generation is not as abundant. 
Um, the one thing that I really uh, think has, has been a, a great improvement uh, in this framework, um, options for uh, renewable energy uh, are really much more equitably um, assigned and credited. Um, shaded and green roofs are still uh, well within the framework and, and not uh, penalized. Um, On-site renewables are possible, but off-site renewables are also uh, quite uh, feasible, uh, which gives building designers a lot more flexibility um, for what to use their roofs. Uh, you know what to do with their roofs. Um, a roof, a roof garden might be a better um, utilization of a of a specific building roof rather than uh, covering it with PV. Um, and oftentimes uh, buildings are not actually able to put PV on the roof. They might be shaded um, by other buildings um, or by you know, the topography and, and, and geography of the region. So uh, with this illustration, I'm showing that um, you know buildings, uh, tall, uh, urban, dense uh, buildings, which are really much more inherently sustainable anyway, um, are not uh, penalized because uh, renewable energy is credited as a function of projected building footprint as opposed to uh, roof to floor area ratio. Um, and you know, I'm showing in this, this slide uh, a much uh, a tall multifamily building uh, has got a full array on the, on the roof. But because it's a much taller building, has a much higher uh, square footage, and um, in in current um, net zero uh, calculations, uh, would likely not be able to uh, generate enough to offset its demand. Um, likewise, this building next to it is totally shaded by the taller building. Um, there's really no use in putting PV on that building, um, but this the building owner is. Uh, is able to purchase off-site renewable credit, um, and and that that will set its demand um, elsewhere, um, which is also actually uh, a much more uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I beg your pardon. Um, a much more efficient um, generation capacity. Um, much uh, solar farms off off-site in regions that are really are primed and prepped uh, for generation um, have certainly been shown uh, to be a much more efficient generation um, than than smaller uh, uh, grids on uh, on site and buildings. So that's really um, the overview um, of this primary energy renewable framework for buildings. We will be uh, covering this uh, very much in depth at a conference that um, the North American Passive Health Network is organizing. It's coming up this year in October and is being hosted here in California in Oakland. Um, this whole conference is geared to um, focus on this primary energy renewables framework um, and looking at how uh, to incorporate renewables uh, and storage uh, capacity, both short and, and, and long term, into our building framework. Uh, we have a really interesting program um, already lined up. Uh, with two days of pre-conference workshops. Uh, we're collaborating with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and uh, PG&E, our lo local utility company here. We're also partnering with the Living Futures Institute um, to host a, a, a track of plus energy um, uh, presentations. And uh, we're very excited to have uh, Scott Foster, the director of the United Nations Sustainable Energy Division, uh, to be our keynote presenter there. Um, and we'll be uh, sharing some very uh, exciting news uh, regarding uh, developments by the United Nations with regards to building um, performance standards. So um, lastly, I will um, get to it. There we go. Um, 
So this is a, a slide that will be shared with you um, where to find out more about this primary energy renewables framework. Um, I encourage you to really look at the source material uh, developed by the Passivhaus Institute, um, articles in Passipedia uh, that really um, kind of dig a little deeper than what I have done here today. Uh, the the best article that I that I think will give you gives you a, a really uh, deep understanding of how this is structured is the PER sustainability sustainability assessment. Um, you can find it in Passipedia.org. Uh, um, a really wonderful resource for anything passive house related. Um, I thank Andre Harmon um, for uh, his help with putting those. Uh, building um, examples together for me and, and allowing him to utilize a lot of his, his slides and his core material. Um, and there's a couple of recommended reading links. There's another one, um, uh, Passive House the Next Decade, that really sets the, the framework for how this was uh, developed and, and the need for um, moving our our building design uh, towards incentives that really um, do allow an all renewable energy future to become a reality. So um, I thank you for your time. It looks like I've, I've taken up the hour pretty well. Um, and I do have, um, we do have time for questions and I'd be very happy to hear from you and uh, hear, um, yeah, what you, what more you'd like to know. And if I've covered this uh, sufficiently, I, um, <laughs> I hope I have. It's a it's a challenging topic to cover so comprehensively, um, but um, you know, it's a, a good place to start, and it's an exciting framework to be working in. So thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, wait for the questions. Thanks, Brian. And yeah, uh, everybody, we got some time for questions, so please drop them in there. And right before we get to them, just a real quick reminder: this session uh, was brought to you by the Green Home. Institute, a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. And as you're getting those questions dropped in there, uh, just so you know, for those of you listening live, you can, uh, to get your CEU reporting, check your email or your spam. A survey will be sent to you after this session closes out. Please take that. For those of you watching on demand, take the 10 question quiz with an 80% passing rate. And just a huge thanks to all of our supporters who allow us to put these sessions on, build Equinox uh, with the smart ventilation system, the Serve, uh, Sun Intuitive, uh, Self Tinting Glass, Niagara Conservation, uh, Passive uh, Panasonic Ventilation, uh, Certainty Air Renew for Formaldehyde Eating Drywall. All of our members, board of directors, um, all of our volunteers, we could not do it um, you know, without any of you. So it looks like we got a couple questions rolling in. Um, do you know the barriers for storage and does that have to do with primary grid power? Hello. So that was that for me, I'm assuming, right? Yep. I'm just, Brett. I'm I'm not sure where the questions are coming from, so I don't know where these. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I will I will read them off. So, uh, so the question here was, uh, do you know the barriers for storage, and does that have to do with the primary grid power? So my very limited understanding of that is um, really it's it's the. The storage of renewable energy is a, is a, is a new technical, technological development that's just starting to become a reality uh, in various places around the world. And it's, it's, I've been reading articles about how the economics of it now are becoming um, desirable. Uh, previously, it just wasn't economical to convert um, renewable, um, renewably generated energy into uh, longer term, longer term storage uh, capacity, and um, I read recently. Uh, mostly, I, I get most of my news from Twitter. Actually, <laughs> um, that's becoming um, a much more uh, economical um, proposition um, in places like Germany, where uh, you know renewable has sort of shifted um, the economics of of, of um, 
power, a grid power supply because the overgeneration in the summers has sort of turned um, power into negative pricing uh, brackets. Um, so now there's become an incentive if, if they can capture that excess generation and, and convert it to longer term storage and then sell it at the higher rates um, in the, in the, the low, gener low renewable generation season, then they can actually make, a, uh, make this an economically viable um, reality. So um, that would be something that uh, utilities should really um, are best positioned to actually take advantage of. Um, you know, small uh, building owners and, and smaller uh, regions don't really have the economic cap capacity to be able to, to develop that. But it, it does make a much better business proposition for, for utilities, regional utilities, to get into that business. Um, so um, I, uh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not an expert in that, in that uh, arena. Um, but just from my, my reading on it and, and trying to understand this whole framework, um, that seems to be where, where that, that's happening. And, um, you know, it's uh, yeah, all, all to be determined. And how that all evolves is going to be really interesting to watch. I hope that sort of answers that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so I guess there's a follow-up. So it falls on the utilities rather than a uh, a system feature was the was the follow up it, it, that would sort of be the logical um conclusion it doesn't seem you know i think it doesn't make economic sense for for smaller building owners to to really look at longer term storage um and then in terms of even the delivery of that you know you don't really need to design your building to be able to to use methane gas in the future because the, the, the gas or, or the hydrogen gas would be really uh, burned at the, the power plant um, and still be delivered as electricity to your building. So that would be the framework that you would, that, that would be utilized under. Um, and here's a question or a couple that I'm going to uh, bundle together. Um, do you believe that off-site renewables make the most sense? Obviously, on-site provide a number of obstacles. And then following up on, on that, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, even looking here in our own backyard, we've got um, community solar programs launching, utilities letting you buy into um, solar fields. Um, but then there's also, uh, you know, RECs and carbon offsets, which is a little more removed from the local community. Um, so what, uh, you know, what, what are the overall thoughts on, on offsite renewables and, and also, you know, where, where do you define that line of offsite renewables for the, the Passive House program? So, um, you know, where, where that line is defined for the Passive House program is, um, I, I have to say I don't know the specifics of that. I would have to, um, you know, you'd have to ask your certifier, your building certifier, to come and get you the details on that. Um, but to the question of, you know, renewables generated in larger, you know, solar fields, um, wind farms, have definitely been shown to be much more um, efficient generators. Um, the economics of those larger, um, you know, solar farms and wind farms make much more sense. Um, and in terms of building design, too, um, you know, there's a lot of buildings. I don't know. Uh, you know, I work as an architect and, and design mostly custom residential, and I'm I'm always banging my head up against planning restrictions. Um, where they're trying to make these buildings look super articulated and have lots of bump outs and dormers and all sorts of um, what, what I call carbuncles added onto your building envelope um, to make buildings more complicated rather than simple. Um, and that also limits, limits the, the actual viable roof area that you have available uh, for solar and renewable generation. So, you know, we're there's all these competing demands at the building um, for what the building needs to do and how it needs to be designed. Um, and then if you add uh, renewable generation on top of that, uh, you know, you're just making things even more complicated. 
Um, so that's, you know, that's another win for off-site generation. Um, you know, economically, if everyone doesn't have to buy an inverter, a micro inverter, and um, you know that it just makes much more sense to do it at scale rather than at the micro level. Um, but um, you know, I believe our reality is uh, it's all it, it's all and not either or. Um, is is going to be our reality of how we need to transition to this all renewable energy future. Um, so. Um, you know, whatever is really both economically and 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 viably feasible um, should be um, encouraged and enhanced. And, and it, um, this framework really really does that and allows the flexibility for um, both. And I think that should that should cover that one. So the next question is, uh, could you go into a little more detail about the penalization of natural gas? As it wasn't immediately clear on how it was penalized with a 1.75 factor, which is lower than the 1.8 of electric heat. Is there a difference in how those numbers are applied? Um, you know, um, that's a good question. I uh, I would have to, uh, I'm just trying to look at, um, I'm trying to pull up my slides here uh, for natural gas. Um, and I'm looking specifically at um, the California slide. Um, the natural gas is, you, you know, you're right. In California, it's not as penalized. Um, it's uh, because the other thing about it is it's, um, they're also kind of considering that this is renewable energy generated nat nat natural gas. So it's not, um, it's not really as, as as heavily penalized as, um, say, oil uh, and coal and methane, uh, which in California are essentially a double um, double the, the PER uh, utilization factor. So um, I'm looking back at my slide um, for Cal California, um, but it does change slightly um, whether it's, it's gas used for heating or if it's gas used for um, uh, domestic hot water generation. Um, so, and and really, it's very also region dependent. So, the, the California uh, PER factors will be different um, than, say, um, somewhere in the Northeast um, or in a region where natural gas isn't as uh, commonly available. Um, so, you know, um, that needs to be looked at very, very regionally specific. Um, so I hope that sort of answers that um, a little, a little better. <laughs> uh, and I think the follow-up there was that it's still producing carbon emissions, um, so it's just interesting that it would fall lower than electrical. Sure, and I um, I would have to you know defer to somebody at the Passive House Institute to look at, at that and to answer that I don't unfortunately have the uh, the background to be able to get into the, the nuances of that. Well, great. Uh, I I do not uh, see any other uh, questions here, so I really thank you for. Uh, your time, uh, Bronwyn, and uh, where, uh, just real quick before we wrap up, again, where can people find out uh, more information? So, um, best place is the source, um, passivepedia.org or the Passive House Institute website, which is passivehouse.com. Um, click through links, um, lots of good uh, reading available there. And then I will be following up um, a conference in uh, Oakland in October, the North American Passive House Network Conference. And you can, um, the website for that, which should be fully populated um, by Friday, is um, naphnconference.com. So North American Passive House Network Conference.com.
um, and I will be there and there will be a lot more um, information on this particular topic available there. All right, great. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks for all of you uh, listening. Um, I uh, We will not have a session next week. It'll be spring break, so hopefully everybody gets out and enjoys it. Um, but uh, Take care. Great. Thank you so much, Brad. Appreciate the opportunity.